Let's begin today. We are in our series called The Fall. This is the third week in our series. The first week we looked at the fall of Satan, how evil came to the world. And uh, we talked about that uh, Lucifer's sin or his issue that he was dealing with was pride. And that pride is self-worship. And then last week we looked at the fall of humanity, Adam and Eve's decision and what they did, and that they did not honor that which was the Lord's. We gave you a a list at the end of service of seven things that God said is holy, and we kind of just took a self-examination, said, hey, how are we doing with these seven things that God says is holy? And today, we're going to talk about the legends of the fall, all right, legends of the fall. Some of the big stories in the Bible of people who fell and what happened in their lives. And the first person we want to look at is King David. David. Now, when we talk about David, there's really two Bible stories that most people talk about when it comes to David, right? David and Goliath, and then David and Bathsheba. Right? These are the two stories we talk about. David and Goliath and David and Bathsheba. And, and, I, and I think that we even view our own lives this same way. We really remember the greatest things that we've done. And then we really remember the worst things that we've done. When most of us, 80% of our lives live good, wholesome, healthy lives, we forget that. We forget that we're pretty consistent day in and day out, week in and week out, and we have some highlights, we have some big moments, and maybe we got some really bad moments. And that's kind of what we see with David. We remember his victory, and we remember his really bad mistakes. And so that's what I want to look at today, is one of his really bad mistakes. We're going to look at the story of David and Bathsheba. In 2 Samuel 11, verse 1, it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. So where is David supposed to be? Out at war. At the time that kings go out to war, so David is supposed to be out at war. Instead, he sends Joab out in his place. And where does David stay? Jerusalem, he stays home. He stays home. Off to war, that's where he's supposed to be. And I want to show you this. Maybe you know this story. Um, While David's home, he's supposed to be out at war. He stayed home. He goes out onto the roof of his castle, and he looks over, and he sees Bathsheba naked. And he's like, yow! He's like, never seen such a beautiful woman. And he's like, yo, go find out who that woman is. Bring her to me. And you know, whatever, they, they end up sleeping together. She gets pregnant. Now he's like, yo, we got to like figure this out. And so he calls her husband home from battle, tries to get them to sleep together. So he thinks he got her pregnant, but it don't work out. And, and so he, they end up killing her. They end up killing him. And then uh, David and Bathsheba, the, the baby's born, and then it dies. All this tragedy, right, from this one moment, from this one thing. And I want to teach you real quick the underlying issue here. A fall is about to occur because David is not doing what he was created to do. Now listen to this. I think we fixate many times on, well, I got in trouble because I did something wrong. Wonder if we changed our thinking a little bit. Wonder if we became proactive about life. No, you got in trouble because you were not doing what you were supposed to be doing. It's different. It's different. See, I got in trouble because I did something wrong. And so we blame it on the action of doing something wrong instead of saying, wait, wait, I could have avoided this situation if I was doing the right things. If I was replacing my boredom with good habits and good hobbies. All right, let me paint a better picture. Kings go off to war. It's what they do. It's who they are, okay? Men, I want to talk to you specifically for a second. Men, we were created to be conquerors, to be conquerors. You always can know a man who's not a conqueror at home because he tries to conquer things that aren't his to conquer. When a king 
is not conquering the right things, they inevitably will go conquer the wrong thing. Because men are conquerors. Let me talk to the ladies for a second. Let them win every now and then. Let them win every now and then. Right? Let them be the king of the castle. Let them be amazing. And, and I'm telling you, when he feels like he's conquering and winning at home, he will win in other areas of his life. But if my man is not winning at home, he's going to be miserable everywhere else in his life, and he will conquer things that are not his to conquer. <coughs> right? Kings are supposed to be conquering land. They're supposed to be getting new kingdoms. And when he wasn't there doing that, he was conquering Bathsheba. Because kings are conquerors. It's what they do. It's what they were created to be. And listen, wives, ladies, girlfriends, you're not going to change them. It's in us. It, was, it is God inspired in us to be providers, to be winners, to be conquerors. It's what we are and what we do. And that's when like if, if, if a guy gets injured and he can't work and can't provide for his family, he becomes depressed and all these other things because it's in him to be this man. This is in David. He's supposed to be out at fighting war. He's not in the place that he's supposed to be. And I just want to throw this out there to you today. If you're not happy in life, it might be because you're not doing what you were supposed to be doing. I'm not saying you do anything wrong. I'm saying you're not doing the right thing that God created you to be and God created you to do. All right? So let me throw this out there. Are you making progress in life? Has this year been better than last year? Just different things. Is your health better this year than it was last year? Is your finances better this year than it was last year? Are your relationships better this year than it was last year? Is your communication better this year than last year? If there's not progress in your life, you know what ends up happening? You start looking at those closest to you and blaming them for it. Well, if they, if they would just work a little bit harder, if they just worked on them, if they weren't so sassy to me. But the real problem is you're not happy with you. You feel like you're underpaid at work. You're not appreciated at home. And all these things point back to you. And so then we begin to make dumb decisions. We begin to make the d- dumb decisions, right? David and Bathsheba's decision to, 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 to do this act led to many more heartaches and pains. If you read through the book of Psalm, you can see some of the stuff that David was in anguish about, in torment about. And a lot of it stemmed from this decision right here. And I know that we fixate on his sin and all the bad things that he did, but it stemmed from not being in the place that God told him to be. Not, being, not doing what God created him to do. I just thought, are you doing what God created you to do? All right? Let's look at the second, the second fall. is a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Anybody heard this story before? Ananias and Sapphira? A little bit of backstory. It's, this is the book of Acts. And uh, the, the, the people of the church are all bringing their goods together. And they're saying, listen, we need to care for each other. We need to make sure that everybody's cared for. Everybody has food. And so people are selling off properties and they're selling off homes. And they're bringing the money in so that this church can be established and that the kingdom of God can move forward. And this couple, they come up with a clever idea to look good. Watch. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, They also sold a piece of property. Everybody was selling property. They also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest of it and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Now maybe you're like, okay, but I don't understand. 
What's the big deal? He couldn't just keep his own money? Absolutely. Absolutely. Watch what, watch what Peter says to him. Didn't the land belong to you before you sold it? And after you sold it, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? What made you think of making up this whole story? So let's just put this in modern idea, right? They sell a piece of property for $100,000. They bring $80,000 into the church and they're like, here, we are so godly and we're so moved by the Holy Spirit that we gave all of our money to the church. But they really put 20 grand in their pocket. Who cares that you put 20 grand in your pocket? That was your money. That was your land. Do whatever you want. But what made you think of the story? What made you think up that you needed to look better than you really were? It's a temptation that can easily creep into the church. It's actually been in the church for a very, very long time. Looking more spiritual than you really are. Looking more spiritual than you really are. Just because you can amen and hallelujah louder than everybody else, but your personal life is a wreck. I watch young people leave church by the droves. Young people leave church, church at large in America by droves because their parents act one way in church and they act a different way at home. With the same mouth that they're hallelujah, praise God, they're cussing their kids out at home. And the kids don't know what to do with that. Your kids, your kids don't know how to process hypocrisy. They don't know how to process, but wait a second, so which one are we supposed to be? And you know where the temptation comes from and, and where we're really being attacked mostly with this is through social media. Social media. Putting off a persona that's much bigger than we really are. Right? 25 takes to get the right picture with the right sunlight before we post it on social media. I see people all the time. They're on the brink of divorce, but they want to put all these pictures on Facebook and social media how in love they are with each other. They're like, y'all, look how much in love they are, how amazing their marriage is, but yet they hate each other. Like, what's, what's the persona for? What's the storyline for? What's the lie for? And, and then here's the danger. Well, my marriage isn't as good as that marriage. Look at them. They're in Cancun again for the third time this year. You don't take me to Cancun, Bobby. <laughs> what that picture doesn't show is that that's the third Cancun vacation on the same credit card. They're in debt up to their eyeballs. They're about to lose their house because they haven't paid their mortgage because they can't pay the Cancun payment. But we're jealous of them. We're envious of them because we want their highlight reel or their false persona and we're judging it based upon our behind the scenes. See, this is what they're kind of doing here. What made you think? What makes you think of Shouting out and screaming out in church all the hallelujah, praise the Lord, we're in the right outfit, but yet you don't even have a relationship with God. You don't even pray or read your Bible. You don't even know what John 3.16 says. And this is what he's saying here. He's like, what made you think that you needed to be this for God to love you? What made you think you had to put on a performance for God to care about you? He loves you just the way you are without your persona, without your mask, without your pretenses, without your pretending. He loves you just that way. But <laughs> I don't really know why God was so harsh with them. Like literally like he made an example of this. Peter says to her, or Peter says to him, you haven't just lied to man, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Ananias falls over dead. Dude dies in church on a Sunday morning. <laughs> 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 I 
But like any good preacher, he got to keep preaching. So they kind of just, they drug him off stage. They drug him off stage and he just kept preaching. Right? So Fira comes walking in. And she's all, she got her diamond bracelet on because she just spent some of the money. And she's like, ah, I love Jesus. <laughs> and Peter says to her, hey, Ananias just told us this story. You sold us property. Is the story true? And she's like, absolutely. Peter says to her, the feet of the man that just carried your husband out are still at the door. Boom. She falls over dead. Cart her out. All right? Now, listen, I don't really see God dealing with humanity this way. Right now, I believe that we're in a dispensation of grace and God's covering. But I feel like we're falling and dropping dead inside all the time. When who we are and who we pretend to be becomes too far distant. You ever stood on a ladder before trying to reach over to grab something? And the further you reach over, you feel that ladder sliding. That's what ends up happening when who you really are and who you're trying to pretend to be are far apart. It makes you unstable and you're heading for a fall. Third person I will look at today who had a great fall is a man named Daniel. Daniel. Daniel had three best friends. You know what they were? Who, their name? Shadrach, Meshach. And Abednego. Did you know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was actually their slave names? Daniel was actually his real name. His slave name was Belshazzar, I believe. Um, anyway, fun fact. None of us really know them by their real name. Hananiah, Misael, and I don't even know the last one. These three dudes. <laughs> so Daniel is in a season where he's been interpreting dreams for the king. And he's become very successful at it. And the king's men are pretty upset that he's finding so much favor with the king. And so they conspire to get Daniel, to get him out of the picture so he can't keep doing this. And so they get the king to sign a decree that for three days, no one can pray. No one can pray. And so Daniel's like, well... I'm not going to follow this decree. I know my God. I know what I'm supposed to do. Let's read this. In Daniel 6 verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the window was open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he fell down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and, asked, and asking God for help. These three men went in, they saw him praying, they got him. They knew it was up. See, but David's fall was a little different than all the other falls we've been talking about. David's fall was to his knees in a time that he knew that he was being treated unfairly. So asked, the last time you were treated unfairly, was that your initial response to fall on your knees in prayer? Was it to respond in a not so nice way? See, David, or Daniel knew that the way up was down. He knew to say, God, I can't do anything about this situation. But I know what you called me to be. I know what you called me to do. I know that this is the way that I will win this war. That we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of dark. That God, if you are for me, who can be against me? What shall man do unto me? He got down and he prayed. He fell to his knees. If you're going to fall, this is the way to fall, on your knees. Daniel refused to be like everybody else, falling to the way of the world. So he fell to his knees to ask God for help. Now watch this in Daniel 6, verse 16. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him in the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve, continually rescue you. I wonder what would happen if one of your friends at work was like, hey, I know you're one of those church people. I just got diagnosed with something, something's going on in my body. 
would, would you pray for me? And you pray. And something happens, like it works. And they come back and they, hey, listen, I don't know what that was all about, but that God that you serve healed me. That God that you serve continually, whatever you did, it worked. I feel better. Right? This is what he's saying. May that God that you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought, covered the mouth of the den. The king sealed it. Long story short, king comes back the next day to check on him. When he came near the den, he called out to Daniel in an anguished voice, verse 20. Daniel, servant of the living God. Has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, Ready for this? May the king live forever. Is that really our response when politics don't go our way? Is that really our response when some kind of decree happens that is injustice towards us? May the president live forever. Here's my I'm just, I'm just saying this might be why we're not getting Daniel's results. The king just threw him in jail. Threw him, no, no, no. Threw him to the lions to be eaten. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave the orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wounds were found on him. Yo, a revival broke out. A revival broke out. Because David knew how to fall to his knees. In my mind, I wonder whose life could be changed if you fell to your knees. Whose life could be spared? Whose life could be saved? Who could be helped if you had a healthy prayer life of your own that you just continually lifted up certain people in prayer? Falling to his knees brought a spiritual revival. Here's what I've learned. Falling to your knees is a protection plan from falling into sin. Falling to your knees is a protection plan from falling into sin. As we close today, I want to talk about one last fall. I was really trying to figure out how to wrap this whole thing up and put a pretty bow on it. And I wanted to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about how Jesus had fallen. And I was like, okay, you know, he came from heaven to earth, but that wasn't really a fall, that was a choice. And I had to study. I had to really study hard for this one. In all of Scripture, now I'm sure he fell down as a little boy, but there's no stories about that. In all of scripture, I could only find one time that Jesus ever fell down. The Bible says that he was brought to this place and he was whipped 39 times with a cat of nine tails on his back. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes were healed and they beat him, they whipped him. The Bible says, then they mounted a cross to his back and demanded that he walk from the place of his beating to the place of his crucifixion. And as he walked through the streets, carrying this cross, he carried our sin. He carried our shame. He carried our past. He carried our problems. He carried our falls. He carried our, um, uh, our, our hurts, our habits, our hangups. He carried the weight of the world. And in that moment, on the streets of the city, the weight became too, bare, too, too much to bear. And he fell on the ground, the cross crashing on top. The also at that time, the Roman 
soldier grabbed someone out of the crowd and made him carry the cross the rest of the way. But in that moment, I want to tell you this, that Jesus fell because of us. The weight of that cross was crushing. It wasn't because the wood was heavy. It was because the sin was great. It was because of the price of all humanity was in that cross. That's why he fell. But in that moment, when he fell because of us, he also fell for us. Now, when I'm saying that, you ever fallen for somebody? You ever fallen in love? God fell for you, man. The day he made us, the day he made man, he sat back. He's like, I love you. I love you. I remember. Huh. I remember those first seconds that my wife gave birth to our first child. I was still cleaning that white, waxy stuff off her head, looking at this baby. It wasn't the cutest thing I've ever seen. It was kind of like all like messy and stuff. But I was so in love. I hadn't had a name, I hadn't picked a name yet. The child never did anything for me. Never said my name. Nothing. But in a moment of seeing my creation, I was in love. I was in love with something that was incapable of loving me back in that moment. I loved the baby and it had done nothing for me, hadn't served me, hadn't told me to love me back. I loved the baby, my Caitlin, because I chose to. I chose to love her because she was mine. I made her, she came from me. God fell for you. The moment he made us, and you're no different than anybody else in all of creation. You know worse, you know better. We're all his children. He sits back and says, I fell for you thousands of years ago. I chose you, I called you, you're mine. There's nothing you can do that can separate you from my love. I fell for you. Would you fall for me? And this has been the mission of God since the beginning of creation. I fell for you. Would you fall for me? Would you fall for me? What would that look like? What would a daily relationship with God look like that you fell for him? Before we make decisions, do we think of God? Do we include him? Before we spend money on things moving forward, do we ask God, hey, is this wise? Is this a good investment? Is this what I should be doing? Do we bring him in to the moments of our lives that don't just matter the most, but matter to us? He fell for you. Would you fall for him? Maybe you're here today and you've already been a Christian. You've already had a relationship with God. But you know you haven't really fallen away from the things that are pulling you away. you kind of been like holding on to parts of the things that are pulling you away and you're kind of like partly committed to God and you realize that there's a shift in the season of life and it's like, I can do better at this God thing. I can do better at this church thing. I can do better at this prayer thing. I could do better at this Bible. I, I could do better. I think that maybe, maybe today could be one of those moments where it's like, I'm going to fall for you, God. I'm going to fall back in love. I'm going to fall back to that place. I want to take a moment for those of you that are already believers. I want to pray for you. And then those that are not, that, that have not made a commitment to Christ, I want to pray for you after that. Father, we thank you today for speaking to us that, that Lord, you would encourage us in our relationship with you. The word says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So God, I pray that as we leave here today, there's, there's nothing that's making us feel bad. 
but God, that we would be inspired to connect with you in a deeper way. I thank you, Lord, today that all those believers who are in here today, that you would help us to work on those things within us that try to pull us away from being who you created us to be. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we want to pray with you today. And Here at Family Church, we just make it very simple. We just want to pray a prayer with you, a, a commitment, confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we all want to pray it with you. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, come into my life. Change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time today, could you let me celebrate you one second? Just wave at me real quick. Say, hey, that was me. I prayed a prayer today for the very first time right here. Awesome, man. Anybody else over there? Awesome. Anybody else real quick as I look across the room in the back? I see you. Awesome. Congratulations. Right there. All right. Both of you. I see you. Amen. So we have a next step for you. There's a little booklet on the seat back in front of you. It says, Welcome Home. It talks about Christianity, what we believe here at Family Church. That's our gift to you. We ask that you would not rush up, but connect with somebody. Let somebody know the decision that you made. If you're new here, stop at one of the high top tables. Make yourself known. We are working on a brand new program that I was trying to release today, but it's not perfect yet. It's called Starting Point. And what Starting Point would be is a six-day devotional for people making a decision for Jesus Christ today. They opt into it, and tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., they get a text message from us that would give them a link to a devotional that has a video and a journal that they can follow along for six days. So the first six days of their walk with Jesus Christ is mapped out in a devotional on what they should be doing and how to get their relationship with God started off on the right point. I mean, yeah, we're excited about it. Fingers crossed next Sunday we'll be launching Starting Point. We were actually looking at starting it in December, but I can't wait. It's too good. It's too exciting. It's too good. We got to get it done. Amen. Let me bless you today. Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts and encouraging us today. As we leave here today, Lord, I bless everyone in the sound of my voice. That the head and not the tail, above or never beneath. Everything they set their hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you.